Welcome to episode number four of the Bogleheads Life Stages podcast. Bogleheads are investors who follow John Bogle's investing philosophy for attaining financial independence. Today's episode features Jim Richmond, designer of the Flexible Retirement Planner. This recording was made on March 24th, 2021. Nothing in this video should be construed as personalized investment advice. Uh, well, you know, what about retirement? What about, um, you know, how much do I need to have saved? And I um, started looking around and I put the, um, I wanted something that had implemented variable withdrawal. I was looking for a calculator online that had um, just some sort of decision rule. Uh, I had read some recent paper. There's, I think, Goyton, um, Jonathan Goyton had, had written about how to kind of, you could get a slightly higher withdrawal rate with a good probability of success if you have some some decision rule in the withdrawal process that adjusts the withdrawal based on how well the plan is going. So if, if you have a bad sequence of returns, you could maybe cut back spending a little bit. And if you allow that in, in the model, you end up with a, um, a higher withdrawal rate supported for a given probability of success or a given success rate for the retirement plan. So anyhow, I couldn't find that calculator. So I decided to put this one together and uh, initially just did it on a whim, uh, but I um, I posted it to the web and did get some, some positive feedback of, about it. And after um, six months or a year, I decided to turn it into a business and, um, and have done it. Okay. So right now you should be seeing, or within a few minutes, seconds, you'll be seeing the, um, the main page for the Flexible Retirement Planner. And this is what you get if you hit new plan uh, up in the top left. It resets all the inputs to their defaults. Let me see if I can. And um, the inputs to the planner should be relatively straightforward. Uh, current age, retirement age, life expectancy. For this demo, I'm gonna start out, we'll assume uh, the retirees 40 years old, uh, the, uh, the, the um, person using the planner and the uh, retirement age 65 and the life expectancy 95. We'll say 3% for inflation, we'll leave it at the default. These income tax, uh, income tax and investment tax rates should include state tax and federal tax, any local income tax if it's, if it's, all, if it's paid. Um, and then for portfolio value, we're going to say that there's a, a currently a three hundred thousand dollar. Make sure I get that three hundred thousand dollar tax deferred portfolio. Um, by the way, this min IRA four hundred one k withdrawal age um, trips people up sometimes. I'm actually in the next release going to move that into settings just because it it gets in the way. Basically, that's the minimum penalty free IRA four hundred one k withdrawal age. So most people never need to touch that. And that's part of why I'm going to move it to settings. So just so you don't get tripped up on that. And then I'm going to say that this, um, for this plan, this person, this 40 year old is going to put $15,000 away every year uh, in their tax deferred annual um, savings. And then the other inputs, we, we have investing styles and um, I'll just leave it at the default. And these are sort of canned portfolios um, that have given this investment mix. I strongly suggest folks take a look at the um, Simba's back te testing spreadsheet. Um, that's a great, um, a great resource for figuring out for your own portfolio um, what's, what's a good, you know, what's, what's a good return and, and, and uh, standard deviation to use. But you could use these canned ones at least to get started. Uh, by the way, I guess I should do the standard disclaimer. I'm not a financial planner and I'm not an uh, investment expert. So um, nothing I say should be interpreted as investing advice or, or financial planning advice. Um, I do know about the tool and I'm happy to answer questions about, of course, how to model things that you'd like to model uh, in your financial plan. But I can't provide any kind of help or advice on, on the financial planning side. Um, Next, we come down to retirement income. And in this case, we'll say that, um, that there's gonna be a $25,000 retire, annual retirement income. Let's say it's a, a, couple, a couple and they're both the same age. And they're gonna start at age 67, re, uh, earning that, uh, withdrawing from that social security uh, or taking that social security income. Retirement spending is 50,000. And this spending policy is again, that decision rule that I talked about and I'll, I'll get into the details of this later, but we'll leave it at the default for now. And then we'll hit run. 
And so what we see with this set of inputs, we have a, a fairly robust plan. On the left, you see the graph, which the um, purplish uh, bars are the tax deferred portfolio. The blue bars are the taxable portfolio. And the reason that we're seeing this changeover from tax deferred to taxable is that RMDs are kicking in automatically at age 72. And so that's, that's why we're seeing the tax deferred portfolio decreasing. On the right-hand side, um, we can see the probability of success is 99%. We run 10,000 paths through the retirement. So basically that's gonna draw uh, 10,000 different unique random sequences of return. And based on those sequences of return that we draw one for each year of, of the retirement plan, um, there, we're going to have a, a varying result. And so in this case, we ran 10,000 paths through the uh, plan, and we had probably between 50 and 100 failures to get a 99% probability of success. Um, and the average spending shortfall is 16%. And that's really just a metric. Um, I think it was Mosh, Masha Malevsky um, had some research that was basically wanting to try to quantify when, a, when the plans fail in a Monte Carlo simulation, how bad is it? Um, it's, you know, is there a way to tell uh, plans that fail earlier versus plans that fail later? And uh, spending shortfall tries to do that so that if you had two different retirement plans with two different sets of inputs and they were both showing a 90% probability of success, one still may be more robust than another if it turns out that the failures uh, happen earlier in the plan for one compared to the other. And that's what's average spending shortfall. It says just looking only at the failures, how much of the spending that was intended to happen in that plan got a chance to happen before the portfolio ran out of money. And so with this 16%, that means 85 on average, even with the failed plans, they made it 85% of the way through the retirement before the portfolio ran out of money. And again, we're only talking about 50 or so failures here, given the 99% probability of success. But for those 50 failures, even they made it about 85% of the way through retirement. Is That's what the spending shortfall is telling you. The other thing I want to talk about here, the initial portfolio value. Um, the other values are median values. So portfolio value at retirement is 1.5 million median ending portfolio value 2.5. Um, and so the way those medians are, are pulled, we, we do 10,000 uh, simulation paths and we sort the results. So we have basically 10,000 ending portfolio values to deal with. How do we display that? Most effective, you know, sort of easily to understand approach is to show the median. And that would be sort all 10,000 results in a table and then choose the result at row 5,000. That's how we would pull a median out of, out of that. Um, so again, 10,000 results, sort them in ascending order, and then pull the middle one, the 5,000th one. And that's what we see here. Uh, just to give it a little further on that, if we click this checkbox that shows the portfolio value bands, notice that we see um, the, the lines here are showing the lower and upper band. And that's the 10% and 90% um, percentile bands. And we can see that uh, seven looks like about 800,000 is the bottom 10% value and about 7 million is the um, top 10% uh, value or the 90th percentile value. So that the bottom value is actually, again, and if you think of that sorted table with 10,000 ending portfolio values, the median is the 5,000th, the bottom 10% is actually the 1,000th row, and then the top 10% is the 9,000th row in that table again, sorted in ascending order. So, um, so that's, that gives you an idea of the variation that we have. Um, the, the simulation is not producing one result and says, hey, here's your answer, you were done. It's actually producing a, 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 a large amount of output. And the job is to try to consolidate it into something that's understandable. And the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is this percent of expended uh, expenses funded. Um, we've got the flexible spending policy selected. That's the one with the decision rule. But because this is such a, a robust plan, we're actually funding between 97 and 113 percent of expenses. So we're not we're not having to cut back our spending uh, much more than just a few percent here uh, on average in 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 the uh, in the retirement plan. 
The other thing that I want to bring to your attention is the detailed view table. This is a year by year table that allows you to, um, to see the result. Oh, by the way, the, um, the results both in the summary view and in the detailed view table are all shown in present value dollars. So these are not, these, these, the, the planner takes inflation into account and all of these amounts are adjusted for inflation as we go through the plan, but they're shown in present value, non-inflated dollars. So this is this, the ending portfolio value will be a much greater amount in nominal dollars, but it will have spending power of 2.5 million uh, in today's dollars. And the detailed view is the same way. So these, all of the results in the table and the simplest way to kind of grasp this, I think for many people is that um, the new investments and the retirement spending are actually adjusting for inflation. So they will, um, they will increase every year in nominal amount. But notice in the table, they show as being flat. And that's because they're exactly keeping up with inflation. And because we're showing this in present value dollars, those amounts stay stable, stay steady from year to year because they're exactly keeping up with inflation. If an amount is growing greater than the rate of inflation, it will increase from year to year in this table. And if the amount is growing less than the value of inflation, it will decrease. So we can see here at the retirement year at age 65, we see the cash flow situation starts to change. Uh, we go from putting 15,000 a year into our um, deferred account to uh, now at age 65, we start uh, planning to take $50,000 out of, we need 50,000 of spending. And so you'll notice here, the total withdrawal is actually 62.5, which is because the, um, the plan is grossing that up in order to account for income taxes that are gonna be due on that tax deferred withdrawal. The other thing I want to bring your attention to is that on the right hand, uh, the rightmost column is the probability of success and the number of failures in parentheses. So the probability of success is a cumulative number as you go from row to row or year to year. Um, and then the number of failures in parens are the number of times out of 10,000 that the simulation ran out of money in that particular year. So you'll see we start to pick up some failures starting at age 80 even we have one. And so, um, it still shows 100% because out of 10,000, it's just a rounding error when you only have one failure out of 10,000. But you'll notice as we kind of go there, go down the, the list, we get more and more failures until we um, finally get enough uh, 50 we probably need to get from 100 down to um, 99. I assume it's rounding down there. Um, and so we're seeing the failures here from year to year, um, just as an indication of kind of how things are going, what's happening. And I um, also want to show the um, show more details in this table. You can see even more. Now, this can get overwhelming pretty fast, but, um, but it's a lot of data. And basically, one of the things that you can see here in this additional detailed table is that we start to look at age 72, we start pulling RMDs out. And you can kind of track what's going on with required minimum distributions from the tax deferred account. So we start with um, and we've got the amount and the taxes and then how much available for expenses. It looks like we don't need uh, to take any withdrawal out of, the, uh, out of the portfolio because of the RMD is greater than, than what we need, I believe. Yeah, no additional, no additional withdrawal needed. Now, this, this table can be a little overwhelming, um, but if that's not enough data for you, you could right click on any of the column headers and you can say show all columns, which will give you even more data. Um, and the idea is that I'm just basically dumping all of the information that I have in the simulation. And uh, if you right click on any cell, you can um, copy it to the clipboard or export the table and it'll paste right into Excel. I'm sorry, yeah, right click on this and, and this will paste into Excel. So you can then manipulate it and manage it a little bit easier. Okay, I wanna go back to the summary view. And let's say, because this plan is so robust, let, let's see what happens if we, can, if we lower the retirement age to see if maybe we could retire at 60. <clears throat> then we run it again. And now we notice this is, we get a 93% probability of success. So that's not bad, <clears throat> but the stoplight is yellow and not green. And the reason for that is because it's just indicating that the percent of expenses funded varied because of the flexible spending policy 
down as low as 86%. So you might have had to take a 15% um, reduction in spending um, in some of the runs of this, um, of this particular set of inputs in order to get that 93%. And we can configure that um, by going into settings to see if um, what the minimum amount or the maximum amount of spending cut we're willing to take. Um, so the minimum default is 75%. So we're actually, by default, the minimum, uh, the spending cut could be as big as 25%. And that, that's deployed gradually over the simulation if the portfolio is continuing to de decline. Basically a really unlucky bad sequence of returns happens. Um, the planner will knock back uh, a couple few percent off of spending every year until it gets down to 75% of the desired spending and then it won't knock back anymore after that. But we can adjust this. And so let's set this to 90% so that we're, we're willing to be flexible, but not that flexible is what we're saying here with this 90% um, minimum expenses to fund. So we're doing, again, we're using that decision rule, but we're only willing to cut back 10%. And let's see what that does. We had a 93% probability of success and, and then we had um, the spending getting cut down below 90. We run it again. Now we've dropped the probability of success uh, because we're not willing to be as flexible, but we see that we're maintaining that 90%. So let's see if maybe if we up the retirement age by a year, does that get us to uh, a 90? And, I, and I'm picking a 90% just as a random amount. You know, people, everyone has to sort of choose what amount of success is, is adequate for them. Um, but notice now, so we can, we can kind of model that all right, now we've got the green light because we've got a probability of success of 90%. And we also are not having to cut back more than 10% in order to get that 90%. So that's a, just a, a general overview of the, um, of the retirement uh, flexible spend, spending model. Now notice if we chose the stable spending and we were completely unwilling and unable to cut expenses, we wanted to exactly fund what we asked for until the portfolio runs out of money, what happens then? And notice we dropped back seven or so percent. Um, so that flexibility got us, got us a, a, a pretty decent boost in terms of the, the, the robustness of the plan. And that's what we're trying to model there. Okay, next I wanna move on to a feature called sensitivity analysis. Um, and this is a feature that lets you take a look at varying ver the, the parameters of the plan in a way that, um, Saves you, saves you from having to make a change, hit run, make another change, hit run, and try to make sense of all the different data. For instance, by default, this is set up to look at the portfolio return standard deviation as parameter one and the annual retirement spending as parameter two. And so we're going to vary the return. And we, this is a, a, a case where we're going to have the portfolio return and standard deviation march in lockstep. So we're going to have 3% return with 2% standard deviation all the way up to 12% return with 18% standard deviation. And then we're going to have spending vary from 40 to 90,000. So then we'll see what this generates. So we're running the simulation actually about three or 400 times here. <clears throat> These are three or 400 times we run the simulation. Each of those times we use a different set of parameter one, parameter two inputs. And you can see those up here. The, Right-hand panel is showing you the results of one of those 300 simulation uh, runs. And so we're, we're at this top square, but we could also select another square by clicking on, um, and we see what, what were the, the parameter one and parameter two values. We had a return of 10 and a standard deviation of 14. We had retirement spending of 50 and a 93% probability of success. So we can get an idea here of, um, what kind of return we need and what kind of spending we can support. And it looks like with this model, we, we can just about support 56, 57,000 or so if we want a 90 something probability, um, maybe even up to 60 or 65 if the return, if we assume a really high return. Um, but the idea here is just to let you kind of explore variations in the inputs. Let's do this again, only this time, let's say we're wondering about what, what we should put down for the inflation rate. And we're just, you know, how, how careful do we have to be about figuring out what inflation to use? And so we maybe we'll put 1% as the minimum and 4% of the max. And then for the second parameter, um, 
let's say we're wondering about income tax, you know, how, how much sensitivity do we have in our plan to changes in the income tax rate? And because we have so much in tax deferred, this is going to matter a lot because those tax deferred withdrawals are taxed at the income tax rate. Let's run this. And now we're seeing again those three or so hundred runs and um, getting an idea of if we vary these two parameters, what does it look like? You can see on the on the x-axis we've got the inflation rate increasing from one percent to four percent. On the y-axis we've got the income tax rate increasing from ten percent to fifty percent. And so we can just get get an idea now. Now, in with one view, and we can see what the um, what the results are with these varying inputs to get an idea of what um, how that how that is going to work out. Great. And um, the last thing I want to go cover on the planner is a, another uh, feature that helps with the flexibility is the um, additional inputs. And so we, we get to additional inputs by clicking on the additional inputs button here. And um, in this case, what I'm going to do is let's just say that this plan is actually for a married couple and they're not the same age. So I'm going to zero out this annual retirement income on the main input page. And instead, I'm going to put it in on the additional inputs page here in the bottom. And I'm going to say, starting at age 67, the older spouse is going to start collecting their social security and they're going to get 12,500 for their annual social security. And we're going to say it's hundred percent taxable. Um, and we'll say, this is, um, John's John's social security. We add row. And now we have, um, John's spouse is Mary and Mary is two years younger than John. And she also wants to have her social security start at age 67, but because she, we're, we're gonna key all of the ages in this plan off of the older spouse. So when John turns 69, Mary's gonna start collecting her social security. And so now we have social security for two. Notice that we've got it set up that it's automatically gonna track inflation and um, we have it at 100% taxable. And so now we go into the back to the main planner window. And if we run this again, we notice there's a slight drop in the, in the probability of success because we, um, we had um, one of the spouses taking that re, uh, social security two years later. We bump the retirement age up. We can get it, get it back up to um, uh, over 90%. And again, I'm just using that. I, that's kind of, uh, for me, I like to see over 90, but everybody's got to make their own own rules about what works for them. Um, the other thing you can model with this is in um, if you want to do um, one time spending, maybe like you might have a, um, a MISC income. And let's say that we want to downsize our house and we're going to plan to do that at age 80. And so we'll say we'll have a one year cash flow. It'll the start age and the end age will be the same at age 80. And then we'll say that we're gonna net, you know, maybe this will be sell the house uh, that's out in the country and move into an in-town apartment or condo. And doing that, we're gonna net $350,000. So that will be the, um, the amount of the cash flow. And let's say that we're, we're gonna have to pay tax on that whole amount at the tax rate. Again, we could, we could you know, adjust this and put a net amount in here and say the taxable rate is zero. If that's easier, depending on how complicated the taxes are gonna be, maybe it wouldn't wanna, it, maybe this mortgage, uh, this house sale wouldn't be taxed at our normal income tax rate. So we might wanna adjust that uh, and just do the calculation kind of off, offline sort of and put the net amount in here. Either way could work. Um, and we'll say sell uh, downsize. And we add a row. And so now we go back to the main planner page and we run again. And now we can see that um, we've got a much higher probability of success. We probably can support that 60 year retirement again. Um, and we can see that this bump in the portfolio right at age 80 when the house sale kicks in or when the downsizing kicks in. So that extra cash flow goes into the taxable portfolio and your, um, 
you can see it, it turned it into a much more robust plan. Another thing you might want to try in here, and we're getting um, down to the end. Um, let's say that starting at age 70, uh, age 85, we want to um, we want to simulate higher expenses because of maybe some medical things. Now, maybe we just want to try this out and see what happens. It might not necessarily be what we're going to plan for for real, but um, we could explore this with a say twenty thousand um, dollar expense, and let's say this is a medical expense, um, and we don't even need to comment it. We put that in. We go back to the main plan and run it again. And notice we we um, we now are um, down a little bit on the probability um, of success. Um, we're still still increasing, but um, but not as not as quick of a rate again after the house sale kicks in. One last thing we could try here if we just want to again, we're kind of playing around and we maybe want to explore what happens if we just have really bad luck and we have a stock market crash at um, age 75. So 10 years in, the stock market does really badly. Now, of course, this, the simulation, because it's running this, um, you know, a random return, random sequences of return 10,000 times, we are going to get stock market crashes randomly dispersed through the whole, through the whole um, simulation. But we're going to just force a crash at age 85, and we're going to force it to be minus 25% with a standard deviation of zero. So it's definitely going to happen. And, um, and so basically, we're overriding the portfolio return to make sure that we get this crash to happen at age 75. And let's see what that does to our plan. Now we see we have the, um, the stock market crash at age 75 drops the portfolio down quite a bit. Um, we kind of chug along for a bit. Then we have the house uh, downsizing, which brings us back up. And now we're kind of doing, doing okay for the, for the last part of the retirement. So we did, we did um, manage to, to work through that, it, it appears, at least based on this model. And so that's just to give you an overview of the kind of things that you can do with the, um, with the retirement planner. Um, and again, there's a lot of...